Here I'm going to go over soil quality. And the take home quote here is treat your soil, soil well and it will return the favor to you. So you want to be careful and mindful of your soil. Um, you don't want to mess it up. And ideally the crops you get off it will be more than bountiful for you. So obvious question is just what is soil quality? Well, it's a combination of things. It's often referred to as soil health, but really more properly called soil quality. And the soil health is kind of the physical properties of your soil, the chemical properties and the biological properties and how they all interact and overlap. That little portion right here in the middle would be your soil health or soil quality, as we're going to call it. So first off, what is soil? Well, soil is or should be about 50% mineral, 25% air, and 25% water. This gives you 100%. Now, whether you have clay or silty clay or silt loam or silt or sandy loam, depends on the percent clay, the percent silt, and the percent sand that you have in your soil. You'll notice the percent clay has a large bearing on what type of soil it is. Clay is very small particles and they influence the properties of soil quite a bit. Now good for growing conditions, as I said, here's the 50-25-25 split. Compacted soil, though, you'll notice a greater percentage of the solid and poorly drained soil has more water and also that same percentage solid, but more percentage of water. And that's what your water log, your air percentage goes down. So these are some conditions you may have experienced or have fields that have this, but ideally you're trying to shoot for that 50, 25, 25 split. And if you get the soil test tree back and they say silty loam, well, this gives you an idea in this triangle of what percentage clay, silt, and sand that you do have in your soil. Balance is the key regardless of what soil you're talking about. So the key part here is to be balanced. There's a lot of different things going on. Not as simple as just one uh, one kind of leg here of the uh, lever. It could be multiple things going on. So looking at the results you get back from the lab, it's important to realize what's high values and what are low values. And the goal is to have a balanced soil. So you want to bring the low values up without adding even greater amounts of nutrients to the high values. And it's a difficult balancing act. And there's some give and take with everything. So quality, this is gives you an idea of the complexities, the Moldert's chart of what's an antagonism or synergistic with certain nutrients and how you affect one and how it affects all the others. Uh, so it can get very complex, uh, can be very hard to understand, at least initially. There's some micronutrients in here, there's some major nutrients and how they all interact. But as I showed in the last one, it's that balancing act that you're trying to maintain. You don't want to just look at one and just raise one. By increasing one, you're also going to potentially affect some others. So it's just important to keep that in mind. And when in doubt, start on the low end because you can always add more. So more is not better. As I said, you want to start on the low end. Uh, excessive amounts of some nutrients can restrict plant growth, negatively impact the environment, and basically cause you unnecessary expenses. We have a deficiency range here. Of a critical range in that sufficiency range. So you want to, here's your yields are increasing. At a certain point, that sufficiency range, it doesn't change. If you keep adding nutrients at this point, you get to this toxic range, you could actually have a reduction in yields. So your goal is to reach that critical level. That's a, at the point what we call no fertilizer response is likely. So up to this point, you keep adding fertilizer, your percent yield keeps going up. Then there's a certain point, and this would be the exact point here, where adding more fertilizer does not give you more yield. It just increases your cost and your time and your investment. So you want to try to be as close to here as possible. Now, if you overshoot a little bit, that's okay. Uh, if you undershoot a little bit, that can be okay too. If you add some fertilizer, you can bring it back up. But the key part is to know when you're close or approaching that critical level, because if you go too high, it could really cause some issues. So what do I add to my soil. There's liquid versions of some nutrients. There's wettable powders. There's granular. Which one do I choose? Well, they all have pros and cons to them. Uh, the liquid. The pro is that it's really easy to measure. Uh, typically, we'll run through an injector easily. And we'll see, talk about drip irrigation and fertilizer injectors. However, the downfall of liquids is that they shouldn't freeze at any point in their life. So storage of them could be an issue. Uh, they take up large volumes, you know, two and a half gallons, five gallons storage. Um, and often there's a stabilizer in it that could settle over time. And that's something if you're saving it year to year. A lot of times you'll see a little bit of a layer develop at the bottom. You want to try to shake them and stir them mid, uh, mid-winter um, just to go through so they're not settling out so you don't lose that stabilizer. Still, over time it has a tendency to drop out of solution and that can be an issue. Wettable powders, uh, they don't settle over time. They're great. Um, small volume for storage. But the cons is they can be messy and hard to measure. Um, often require pre-mixing before tank mixing, kind of like making the chocolate milk. You should put it in the container here, shake it up before you add it to the glass here. 
um, so it can be a little bit harder to mix. Uh, but the advantage is they store small and they don't settle over time. Then we get to granular. Uh, these are easily broadcast, no special equipment needed. Literally, you can take um, a glove and a pail and go and spread them. Uh, but they can't be fed through an ir irrigation system. Uh, fertility irrigation through drip irrigation is not possible with granular. There's different size granular. There's some larger particles, there's some smaller particles. Think of it like applying sand. Um, and that can be advantageous, uh, tend to be cheaper and bought in larger quantities. When you're looking at soil health or soil quality, pH should be your number one concern. Typically, Connecticut, our soil is acidic, and we have two types of lime, so all lime is not treated the same. Do not assume, though, lime needs to be added every year. I've had some fields that do need to be limed um, every year, some are every other year, some are every fifth year, some you fertilize once with lime, and you're kind of done. Uh, I caution you about using wood ash. This can drastically increase your pH. Um, it's great at raising your pH, but it can add it to become too high, and too high is just as bad as too low. We're shooting for just slightly acidic 6.8 for most crops, 6.5 is our goal. Uh, most native soils, we can be hovering around 5, some cases a little bit lower, some cases a little bit higher. Uh, we're shooting for around that neutral. Adding wood ash, I've seen soil approaching 10, uh, which causes all sorts of other issues. When we're adjusting our pH using lime, the two types are dolomitic, which is commonly called agricultural lime, and this is high in magnesium, it's about 12% uh, magnesium. And there's calcitic or garden lime, and this is a lower magnesium content. So if your magnesium is already high, you could be looking at more of a calcitic or a garden lime to be adding to your particular soil. NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen, I put in parentheses here, we determine that with a nitrate test. Um, kind of a little difficult. Um, special test to kind of go through and follow. Um, June nitrate test that we want to do to get a true analysis of your soil nitrate levels. Phosphorus, we want to caution, it's a freshwater contaminant. If you over add phosphorus, yes, it's, we'll say it's important for roots and getting them growing, but if you over add phosphorus, it can contaminate fresh groundwater, wells, and area ponds. Potassium K is commonly needed. Uh, it can be pulled out of soil pretty readily by some crops. Uh, it can show up as a deficiency in some, some areas. Some other macronutrients, calcium. Lime does contain calcium, but for the most part, it's not really plant available. So it looks like in the raw form, it's kind of a silvery look to it. Magnesium, as I talked about, can be an issue with tomatoes. Uh, Epsom salts is great for that, for the magnesium, or dolomitic lime if your soil is low in it. Also, Epsom salts can give you some sulfur, which may be more of a concern due to lack of acid rain we're receiving. Back, um, we had a lot of acid rain coming from some of the power plants out in the Midwest. They since have cleaned up their stacks, as rate those less sulfuric acid, because the acid rain was sulfuric acid that was raining down, and some fields were getting, quote, free sulfur. Now that we're getting not as much acid rain, we're not getting that free sulfur we kind of took for granted in some cases. So certain instances you may see low sulfur, not necessarily on the large scale. Micronutrients are also important, not to over add. A lot of people get hung up in the micronutrients, your irons, your manganese, your borons, your coppers, your zincs, your chlorides. Don't really focus on these. After you get your pH straightened out and your macro straightened out, then you can move to these. They're typically better determined by a test of the leaves, not necessarily a soil, and overall they should not be your focus. Rarely is this a problem on their own. Um, I have seen growers over add these and get into issues. I kind of use the association of micronutrients, consider them to be like a spice. If you can take a perfectly good steak and over spice it, and it will taste horrible. Same thing here, you can take a micronutrient and over add it, and it can really cause havoc on the plants and soil. Submicronutrients. Molybdenum. Odds are very low this is a problem. I know some growers are asking me, oh, I'm low. Should I test for molybdenum? No. Uh, it's such a small amount. Uh, if it's in a fertilizer, it typically comes with a warning, too. Uh, Maybe harmful to ruminant animals for foraging grass where applications have been made. This uh, I found online here. Uh, and I have this, uh, the link on the description to look in the, the sources there. This is what it would look like, but really it mimics a lot of other things. And in our area, I have never seen this really to be a problem. Microbiology, also getting a lot of talk, um, driven by the hobbyist gardeners. I stick to some of the basics, I have some supporting evidence, more than just the manufacturer's brochures. There's a lot of advertising saying this is the best micronutrient. If you add this, you're guaranteed to get bigger crops. Uh, 
not always the case. So you want to make sure your pH and your macronutrients are straightened out before you start moving to microbiology. Um, some examples of some that I've heard, beneficial bacteria, actinidae, azos, companion, here's some examples here. Um, these tend to have some, a little bit more supporting evidence than some other ones I've heard about. Uh, so these might be worth an initial look if you feel everything else is straightened out. For fungi, root shield and mycorrhizae, uh, root shield is root shield plus. Uh, mycorrhizae is being found in potting mixes too. Um, so these can be some good beneficial fungi to look at and target. However, earthworms can't be overlooked. So they have many benefits. Be kind to them and you'll get their free castings. You don't have to go out and buy any. They'll just work their way through the soil. And if they're happy, you'll be happy. Coffee grounds can be a great way to encourage the initial population. You can actually even grow them over the winter in a slightly heated basement. If you're looking at something to do over the winter and want to get a head start and getting some earthworms uh, for the area you plan on growing in, in the spring. Tillage, uh, disturbing the soil as little as possible. Till with a purpose, I always say. There's different types of tillage. There's zone, there's chisel plow. You want to maintain uh, species di di diversity with the soil and the plant. Keep living roots in your soil and keep the soil covered. I mentioned this in a couple of other videos with cover crops and uh, weed management. Uh, but tillage, you want to remember that you are disturbing the soil. Uh, this can be good if you have a purpose, but just to just keep going through and keep beating up the soil can have negative effects over the long term. How to maintain high quality, that species diversity in soil and plants. Keep living roots all year, keep the soil covered. This can be a non-invasive way, it's called a broad fork if you have a very small area. Basically jab this in the ground, after you put it in the ground, you rock it back, and you're just breaking the soil to get some aeration in without really turning or flipping the soil. Tissue testing, um, turnaround time is important if you do want to go through and do tissue testing to determine your plant health. Increased cost, reduced time uh, between sampling and result is worth the price. So if someone will turn the results back in under a week and you have to pay a little bit more, that's worth it. Because tissue testing, you're typically looking at a quick result to fix a problem. Here we see a tomato leaf on a bean leaf here, exhibiting some of these symptoms. This is a nutrient, this is potassium in particular. Um, and you're able to go through and have that be an issue, correct that with some liquid feed, and you, again, can save your crop. So turnaround time is important for the leaf analysis if you do want to go this route. Again, start with the pH, looking at that and your macronutrients. Once you get those in line, a lot of other things will come together, uh, but there are other options. The key part is treat your soil well, and it will treat you well also.